first world order radio finally finally we are on the air no doubt all right all right there's always gonna be somebody in the building on first world order radio begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. And others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, getting your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know how intention is straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories. Shit that works. Peace, peace. We back once again. Apologize for the technical difficulties. But we here. And uh, we have a special guest tonight, Mrs. Angela Epps. And she's going to be dropping information on her new book as well as also um, on what she's doing in the community and um, her other projects which that she has going on. Angela, are you there? I certainly am. Peace, everybody. Greetings, greetings. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, thank you. And thank you for having me on the show. No, and I look forward to sharing some information and some discussion, hopefully, with the community. All right, all right. Well, what you got for us tonight? Well, I'm going to talk about, um, to start, my book, which is called Trying to Make It Till the End of the Week, Everyday Solutions for Single Mothers. And I want to talk about that because it's definitely an issue in our community and I work in education, so I see everything that sort of happens because of what goes on in families. School is the one place that you always see the results of what happens within families. Without even knowing the details, we can tell if something's going on that's not supporting the child. We can tell if the child is happy, if they feel secure, or if they are sort of floundering out in the world. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies that parents can use. Um, and people who read the book say it's really not for just single parents or single mothers. It's for all parents. And I am mm-hmm. always pleased to hear that. It is. It is. I've um, I read it halfway through it so far, and I can tell you that it's definitely for uh, everyone. Um, all parents should be reading it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So if you have any specific questions to ask, that I certainly welcome it. I'll take a breath so you can jump in, and I will just start talking a little bit about it if if that's fine with you. Oh, definitely. That's good. Be ready. Okay. Well, first I'm going to let you know how I came about writing the book. I was It was really about um, 10 or 12 years ago when I was working in the school system in New York City, and everything that we did was about intervention. And I see that you were from Brooklyn, so you know what I'm talking about. And um, so I, what we noticed in the school system that it was that children were struggling. And I had become a single mother myself, 
and I was working and I was, you know, doing a lot of projects at work. I was trying to do the best by my daughter, and I realized that this is effort. There, there are two ways to look at uh, expending energy. It's either struggle or it's effort. So I was putting a lot of effort into it, which meant I was tired at the end of the day. I had a lot of challenges that I faced, but I was satisfied. I was happy. I wasn't stressed. But what I was seeing is that a lot of people were in the same situation I was in, and they were very stressed, and they were struggling. And that's what caused me to write the book. Um, so uh, it's so silent out there, so I will just keep going. Well, what I looked at were the areas that seemed to cause the most challenges. Children need structure. They need to know that parents are happy. Um, they need routine. And sometimes that can be hard to, to come by. And it's very, very hard to come by if our personal lives as adults aren't really together. And to, by together, I don't mean that we have everything worked out or that we um, can solve every problem well, but it really is about having a plan for how we live our lives because if we don't have a plan, we're basically just winging it. And when we are just doing what uh, whatever pops into our minds, we can end up anywhere. And with a plan we are headed in a particular direction. So as part of my um, journey, I think, it really is, because I think these kinds of things are basically on my heart. I've always been interested in community, always been interested in family and problem solving and um, creating a better way. I'm, I'm a growth person. And I said, well, who am I to write this book? How can I, you know, tell anybody anything? And that really is the backstory. Because I was raised by a single mother, but they, my mother and three of her, two of her sisters, um, back when I was a little child, bought a four-family house in Brooklyn. They bought it together. Um, my mother had a child at the time, but the others didn't. But what they did was it set up sort of a communal um, environment. And when they had children later in you know, different circumstances, um, actually made all of us grow up in the same environment, it created a communal system that took a lot of the stress off the family. So rather than having one single mom, I had three mothers, which is um, a lot different because there are different people sharing the cooking, solving the problems, um, creating a household that was very um, structured. And what I realized is that I was putting forth effort in having a better um, experience than many of my peers uh, because I had learned so much from all these women. Um, I come from a family of people who were um, farm, they were farmers before they moved to New York. So they could cook, they could sew, they knew how to raise children, they knew how to make, you know, stretch money, they knew how to do all those things. And since I came up at their, you know, at their, um, getting their knowledge, then those were things that I was pretty comfortable with as well. So I said, well, I'm going to take the things that I know that are making my life work and put them in this little guide because I could see that if I had all this uh, information and I still had challenges, then those who didn't and who were younger and who had fewer resources would definitely need some strategies. Make sense? So um, I set it up as... A guide, only it's a short guide as well. It's only 42 pages because the last thing a busy person who needs resources needs is a, a very thick book where they're going to um, have to stress about when to finish it. So I made it very short, and I looked at four areas that I thought were key. Personal life, uh, setting priorities like food, bills, decision-making, um, handling education, and then some general tips. And that I figured would be a good platform for starting to see how you can parent, whether you have one kid, two kids, three kids, or um, more, but still find a way to keep your sanity. Because what I see, um, and I still see, are lots of uh, mothers in particular who are very, very stressed, very, very tired, at their wit's end. I see them um, at school. I see them in the community. 
and quite often they're um they don't really know where to get you know the ideas they need and um in our community, I think so much of it has to do with um a system that did not always and I think we still don't value um family as much as we need to we don't necessarily have um structures in place where we see where our relationships are a big part of raising our children, and we can't really do it alone. When we become um, single parents or single mothers, we have to really figure out how do we make this work in a society that is so complicated. First area that I uh, looked at was personal life and why did I choose personal life because I think that is one of the biggest areas that um, young women feel compromised in. You have a child now or you have two children and it's all about them. But everybody needs to nurture um, his or herself, and especially if you were young. And I actually worked in a school that has pregnant and parenting teens, and I can see how the teens become um, almost childlike themselves when they get the babies because now it's about the babies, but then they still need so much themselves, and it becomes a, a, a stress for them. So your personal life is of key importance, but once you have children, you also have the responsibility of keeping your children safe. So the question I pose is, can a single mom or a single dad have a personal life? And I say, absolutely, you must have one, but you must set up your life in such a way that your children are safe and you create your space in such a way that um, as you're having your personal life, it's not infringing on your relationship with the child or allowing children to see too much too early um, and things of that nature. So I, I, that's one of my favorite sections, and people who read it will often say, oh, I loved it, I, I needed to hear that, and I love the tips that you gave. And um, so I think that that really does make a lot of women feel better about um, choosing to focus on themselves as well as their children, because in order to be happy, we have to nourish, nurture ourselves. Uh after personal life, I looked at setting priorities. This is a biggie because quite often if we're single parent, that means we have one income, not two, or we are getting assistance, so we have limited resources, and, okay, how do we make this work? Setting priorities is all about uh, figuring out what has to come first. What has to come first is always security, security uh, in terms of, we must have a place to live it's at all possible. We must pay our rent or pay our mortgage. Um, we must make decisions that we're not giving anybody any extra money. And quite often I think what happens is we get a little frustrated if money's short all the time and say, oh, forget about it. I'm going to buy this, you know, whatever it is that I might really, really want, even if I don't have all the cash that I need. And in my guide I say, just fight that feeling because it, if you're having trouble paying the bill this month, if you're short, you're definitely going to have more trouble paying it next month because the money doesn't just magically appear because we're frustrated. So I talk a little bit about um, paying bills, um, not shopping at the corner store all the time because they're going to pay um, charge you more, and just about making decisions um, in your daily life that will keep you afloat Uh that, I think, is important because we do have a lot of young parents. I was fortunate enough to have had quite a bit of experience at the time that I became a, a single mom, but there are many young women who are, you know, 18, 19, sometimes with two, three children, and I think that's um, key that we learn how to prioritize in ways that keep us happy. Another um factor that I think comes into play in our our community, and I, I'm a big post-traumatic slavery um, person because I think that there's a lot of healing that we still have to do in our community, but quite often we are, um, we look for instant gratification, 
and a big part of making our lives work as parents is putting things off. We have to wait quite um, in order to get what we really need, not what we want at the moment to feel a little better, but we wait so that we get what we really, really do want. And that's generally peace of mind, security, uh, knowing that your children have what they need, knowing that we can fix our car if it breaks down, you know, those kinds of things. So that's my setting priority section. After that, I went into education, and education can drive absolutely anybody crazy, uh, myself included, and I'm actually in education. Right, I'm back. Um, still having technical difficulties. Okay. All right. So i I was um, talking. I was talking about the setting priorities, and then I moved on to education. Yeah. And education should um, be at the top of everybody's list because even if your children are small, they will eventually go to school, and once they go to school, there will be issues. I had no idea that. Um, Something so that we all take for granted that our children will go to school can be such a stressor in our lives. So I devoted quite a bit of time to education so that as you're going um, through the process with your children, you figure out uh, the best approach for getting them what they need. Uh, sometimes we can't pick the, the schools that our children are in. Sometimes they're bused across the city. Sometimes they um, go to a local school that you feel isn't adequate. So we don't have control usually over the situations that we um, find ourselves in. But what we have to do is make sure that our children are sort of learning ready. I teach now. I've worked for school districts. Um, I've written educational grants for intervention but right now I'm a high school teacher, and uh, I'm very, very happy in that role because I like to give students as much as I can give. But uh, quite often that's not the situation that parents find. Sometimes the teacher isn't as supportive as um, he or she should be, or sometimes you really don't like the school. So I look at uh, the kinds of things that can help parents stay on top of it. One is to make sure that your child has what they need when they go to school. And basically um, that is to be adequately nourished so that they stay awake and that they get enough sleep. I think if we just started with those two things, it would make a huge difference with small children. I talk to friends often because um, in the old days, and I'm not that old, but in the old days parents weren't um, afraid to set the kinds of limits that kept children healthy and um, secure. Now I find lots of parents want their children to be happy if that means sometimes staying up till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. They won't go to bed. The parent will say, I can't get them to go to bed. And I'm like, of course you can get them to go to bed. It may take you a few weeks to get them in that um, habit, but parents create habits and children fall into those habits. And I've seen so many um, young students who fall asleep just because they go to bed late. And that's a horrible um, start in life because if you're sleepy, you can't learn. When you can't learn, it starts the ball rolling for all kinds of problems that we really don't want to deal with. We have too many um, students already who are labeled with, you know, special needs, and sometimes there really are special needs. And I was a special program teacher for a number of years, and I, there are some valuable services there, but every child who's there um, doesn't need to be, and then there are some students who are not there who need to be. But as parents, what we can do is make sure that they are well-rested, that they don't have lots of sugar and sweet drinks in the morning, that they um, have really basic healthy food, which is often less expensive than um, the things that they like. And that makes a huge difference. I even tell my students when they're about to test, don't eat any carbs. Don't eat carbs. Eat something that's um, 
that's going to be very nutritious and heavy because if you have a donut or you have cookies, you're going to fall asleep. Those simple things will help um, students and their parents have an easier time than they're having. Quite often, um, also, we have to look at what's important in terms of investing in education. We all know that people come with different skills. They come with different personalities. So we have to know our children to the extent that we give them the kinds of experiences they need um, as opposed to what we think is like a stereotypical great kid. Um, For instance, I have students um, now who are about 18 years old, um, some 19, some are 20, should have graduated years ago, and yet they have no idea what they want to do with their lives. And what's very sad about it is that lots of them are very talented, but what didn't happen was nobody saw what their talents were because there was so much focus on the straight academics, just the um, you know, getting the A in this and the A in that and try to get a B and try to get this, whereas that student might have been a major artist or a talented chef or um, great with their hands and they could be a graphic designer. Just it's so much is missed when we don't see our whole child as opposed to sort of getting sucked into the system. So education, I think, um, is key because we need it to nourish our whole child in order for it to be a positive experience for um, you and for your child. It's about knowing what they need and giving them that and not being uh, sort of seduced into creating a typical experience. That really isn't working because the education system has so many problems. Um, Lastly, in the guide, I talk about um, some tips that I think parents should be mindful of. And to, uh, to, I guess, summarize a couple, one is to be part of an extended family because um, parenting is a journey. It takes a long time. It's a lot of work. It's constantly changing, and we must have community. Children need it. And I read someplace um, years ago that children who were part of an extended family or extended network felt more secure than those who weren't. And the reason was that if they had a sense that if something happened to their parents, they would not be alone in the world. And I thought that was very important because our culture and our society has changed that we don't have communal um, living the way it happened, you know, 40, 50 years ago. And we don't have communities where people grow up and stay where they are. They move all across the um across the globe or across the United States and you find the place you find yourself wherever you are but wherever you are for your own peace of mind and for your children's health it's important to um find a network of people who are supports for you another tip i include is let your kids be kids because they aren't little adults and they don't need to worry about what's going on with your personal life or what's going on with the money. They really can't do anything about it, so it's not that I'm saying shield children, but there's no need to put more on their plates than they can handle. I see the result of children being stressed out and nervous over things that really aren't, um, they aren't prepared to deal with. I have another tip about um staying organized because I think our environments can just take our energy if we have too much in them. And we are a consumer-driven society, way too consumer-driven. And we will pick things up just because it's on sale or because it's $2. And before we know it, we have, you know, 3,000 things in our house and we only need, you know, 500 things in the house. So I talk about, you know, not bringing in extra things. And if the things you do have, organize them so that you see these things and it's not draining your energy because clutter will indeed drain your energy. And there are a few other tips that I include um, about buying on sale, not caring what other people think. Um, we are too media-driven, so I get very upset when I have students who have you know $200 sneakers on. I'm like, why on earth are you 
paying so much for your sneakers. Oh, but I really love them, and they're so popular, and I stood online, and I say, well, somebody bought these for you, and I, if it was me, I never would buy them. And I say that because there are other things they could have had that they would appreciate just as much. It could be lessons. So that student who is a who loves music could be taking music lessons instead of having the two hundred dollar sneakers, or they could be having a science camp or developing some talent within that would take him or her way further than those sneakers would ever take them um, so basically it's about looking at parenting from a different perspective. Um, sort of a holistic perspective, because if we can really nurture children in a way that makes them feel secure, in a way that um, prepares them to meet the goals that they set for themselves as well as sort of have them fulfill the visions that we have for them, then we will have a totally different community in the next generation. Um, And I think if we don't look at these things, then we will have – a lot of chaos because right now the society is a very askew in the way it's, it makes decisions, what it um, puts forth as what's important, and we're sort of following that mode. But I don't think there is a mode really. It's just a little chaos. So I think we can sort of reel it in and get it tight and basically get it right. Not that I have all the answers, but they are strategies. Thank you. Are there any questions? Arlene, are you listening? Okay. Alim, are you listening? Okay. Well, I'm not sure if Alim is there or not, but um, for support. Yes, I'm here. With, okay. Uh, I wanted to say a, a bit more about um, some of the venues other than the book. I have a blog that I've started for just people in general, which is um, all about stress relieving, staying um, grounded in a frantic world, and that uh, is all about day-to-day strategies for making life easier, and that's beyond parenting, but just for keeping ourselves grounded. Um, That could be found at um, angelabelcherepps.blogspot.com. And that's all one word. Well, the three names together, Angela Belcher Epps, blogspot.com. And also, um, I wrote grants for several years, and that has quite a bit to do with how I got into intervention because when you look at the research um, to write grants, what you find is that the statistics that we see are nothing compared to what we don't see. And that spearheaded a lot of the projects that I'm involved with. Uh, I did intervention in the Fort Greene section of New York, um, um, Bed-Stuy section of New York, and um, those are some of the hardest-hit areas when it comes to financial and employment issues. So we started um, some magnet schools back in the 90s and what you can what you, I started to see, and this is why I write, is that there are always strategies for addressing issues. There's always some way to look at a problem and see its root cause and put some um, put some effort in a particular direction. Um, I have a grant writing guide that I think is very helpful to organizations that are trying to do community-based work. Um, It's available on my website, and it's called 
grant writing, let's see, what is it? Actually, it's the Handbook for Grant Writing, Easy to Follow Guide for Winning Proposals. And that is um, sort of like the parenting guide in that I wrote it for the layperson. I wrote it so that a person who had never written a grant could actually follow the steps and come up with uh, a proposal. I was a contractual grant writer for a number of years, and we won you know, millions and millions of dollars. But what I found quickly was that the people who needed it the most were unable to hire grant writers. Um, so I wrote the book so that those community organizations, church-based organizations, anybody who's grassroots who wants to access some of those federal dollars could actually um, follow a guide and get it right with some minor editing. Uh, again, that is the handbook. Hello? Right. So now you have the handbook for grant writing, and you also have the grant writing toolkit. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the toolkit is different from the grant writing um, handbook in that it's the, the toolkit is re are really just templates. So I have the information that you would need to gather, and you can fill it in the blanks. I lead you step by step in that toolkit to gather information that's needed to write the grant. All right. Um, I'm trying to think. When you're writing the grant, now, of course, um, there's corporations always that you can um, send these grants to in order to see if they um, have any funds available for certain projects. Um, right. So basically you would just have to tweak those particular um, forms in order to fit your particular situation. Um, Absolutely. But it's just at the templates, right? Yes, and so I got the templates. I set them up to be generic because if, let's say you are um, a youth intervention agency. There are certain activities that you will be conducting within your environment under your project. Uh, the template allows you to collect all the information that you will need to respond to any um, proposal. That way, if something comes along and it's for uh, technology, it's a technology grant, you can lift pieces from your toolkit to respond to the questions in the technology grant. Or if it's a grant for that you can get staff, you will already have your information um, mapped out in your toolkit where you can list it. You'll have objectives related to staff. Um, and that way you have a comprehensive um, document that becomes sort of the foundation for any funding sources that are out there. Okay, okay. Now, you also do workshops um, and raise money for nonprofit organizations. How do all of that fit in? Well, I don't do the, as much of that as I used to. I was actively a grant writer all the time. What I do now, I can do the workshops um, because I want to build other people's capacity to write their own grants. Uh, what happened, and I saw this um, firsthand, was when I was working as a grant consultant, people would hire me, and it's a lot of work. Grant writing is a very tedious, it's um, very, very hard work, so it, we don't come cheap grant writers, basically. And what I would see would be organization after organization hiring the grant writers, but they would use so much of their budget um, for grant writers that they it wasn't feasible for them to sustain it. What, what every foundation and funding source is looking for in projects is sustainability, meaning they want to see that when they give money, the money is used for program. And the way you do that is by building your own host of grant writers in in house so i train uh organizations grant writers and i did i trained not long ago i trained a, a group within a church a rural church community and they were able to raise seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for their um youth center because they create i trained a whole team who could do what they could hire one grant writer to do. But, of course, if it's your team, you don't have to pay them. You have the expertise in-house. And I think that's what we need as a community would be people who can do the things that other people will charge them for. 
All right, so putting together a nonprofit organization would be the first thing to do. Yes. Um, of course, um, what would be the easiest method in order to do so? Um, would you go to the Secretary of State, um, you know, do well, an unincorporated you know, organization, or would you just get online? What would be the easiest way to do so? Well, to get um, to qualify for federal grants and um, just foundation money, you have to be a 501c3 organization, um, which means you're a tax-exempt organization that can receive money from donors. Uh, without that, the person who gives you the money or the organization who gives you the money can't claim it as a tax write-off. That's why you, without that 501c3, you can't get money. Um, so that's the first step is to, um, to you can, and you can go online and find the documents for that, but usually you have to get um, an accountant or uh, legal counsel involved in that because it is a legally binding agreement, which um, requires you to have a board of directors, um, an operating structure, and you know all the background information that you would have for any business. All right. Now, let me say this because a lot of Moors um, in this particular arena, they don't deal with 501c3s. However, um, that's within their own organization, such as the Moors Science Temple of America, or Moors Holy Temple of Science, or part of the Moors Divine National Movement. Um, however, individually, um, brothers and sisters, you may and can have a 501c3. Um, as Sister Angela just stated, I wish that you can um, utilize in order to do, um, you know, to get funding for your grants, um, through your grants, um, you know. So just pay attention to what she's saying because this is something I wish that can help economically um, in the community, and that's why we're having this show tonight. Um, let's get into the um, city and the literature in the African diaspora. Excuse me, I didn't hear. The Abyssinian literature in the African diaspora. Oh yes, um, well these, that's fiction. So that um, is a collection of stories and poems and um, just general literature from North Carolina. It's a tribute to African American writers of African descent. And it came out last year, and I have two stories there um, that are actually the two opening chapters of a novella that will be coming out in the fall. Uh, and it features um, some of some of the best African American writers I think that are out there now. I don't consider myself among them. All right. Um, and these are short stories, and you say they're fiction. Yeah, mine are um, uh, mine are fiction. Right, right. So there's also nonfiction then. Yes, there are some essays in the book, um, as well as some interviews. Yes, okay. and it's a very okay. good read. Um, that's available from. NC State University, they their um, African American Studies program, right, um, issued that. Okay. Okay. Well, let's get into also um, the science of self healing and natural healers. Um, I know that you're definitely um, a practitioner of those particular arts and sciences. Um, about how long? Have you been doing so, and and um, what have you received any benefits from as far as the practice? Oh my, I wasn't prepared to talk about all that, but yes, I, mm -hmm. I'm very much a naturalist. I I think um, we've gotten a way too, I guess, way too technical in healing. Mm -hmm. I think that the body has basically mm -hmm. what it needs in order to be healthy. And we have to figure out and listen to our bodies. So I am very much into eating to live. Um, and I, I'm i a big, I guess, proponent of two things. One is um, eating for blood type because um, there was a book that came out, I guess, about 10 years ago that talked about how the regions that we originated um, Wait, impacted our blood. Um, 
um, Del Monte. Right. Yeah. So you, mm-hmm. are, do you agree with that philosophy as well? Oh yes. Um, I'm how to eat right for the four basic blood types. Um, how yeah. old blood type is about two thousand five hundred to three hundred thousand years old. How A blood type is about 20,000 years old and how B blood type is about 13,000 years old and A B blood type is about 2,000 years old. And based on that scenario, um, based on the way in which that the antigens within the blood are coagulated, um, it should be based on a particular diet. And there's foods in which that, um, I guess you can say, is the, you know, is eaten in order to help keep one's body in a proper um Acidic and right. alkaline, alkaline on ratio. Right, and I mm-hmm. find that makes such a difference with me. Um, when I started, you know, sinus issues fell away, um, and I found that if I even now if I eat too much meat and so forth, um, I just start to have general problems. Sugar is a poison for me. I cannot eat sugar. If I do, I have congestion. Um, my heart palpitates and what I also um, find, and I don't know if you find this as well, is that the healthier I get, the quicker my body responds when I give it something it doesn't like. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And that yes. is true. Yes. So, yes, I um, I drink herbs all the time. I drink nettles for um, allergies. I take um, supplements um, to strengthen my heart. I use cayenne, coenzyme Q10. And um, interestingly enough, a few years ago, I go to a a natural healer, and she's an herbalist, and she said that I had a congenital heart defect, and I was surprised by that because I never knew it, And but I was so tired. I had no energy, and she says, oh, it's your heart. It's weak. And what I find with um, naturopathic healers is that they find problems before their true issues. So I can go to a, a regular doctor and they don't see anything. But if I go to a natural healer, quite often they will pick up the subtleties um, before it's actually manifested as disease. So she saw the weakness in the heart and I was so tired and she told me to take um, the coenzyme Q10 and to start the um, cayenne. And I went to the regular doctor just to check, you know, with um, the EKG and so forth. And I indeed did have an enlarged left ventricle. And so I started her protocol with the vitamins and the cayenne. I went back four months later to get um, an echocardiogram. And the technician said, oh, I wish my heart looked as good as yours. It was back to normal. And um, so it was really a a testimony for me that... um, the herbs and the natural pathic way can really work for me. Yes, and see, I'm a um, master herbalist as well as also licensed as a natural path. So um, that's that's right up my tree right there. And some good other herbs in which that is good for the heart is hawthorn, berry, garlic, as well as also cayenne pepper, and those three together um, definitely would knock out almost any helmet dealing with the heart. So. Um, oh. He was right on point with the cayenne pepper. The cayenne pepper is excellent. It helps with the circulatory system, um, the blood, as well as also digestive. And a lot of the problems come through the digestive system. So um, the cayenne pepper helps with the regulation, acts as a mild laxative in order to get the, um, the poisons and the toxins um, that mm-hmm. is built up within the digestive system, small and large, in order to be you know, basically defecated out, you know, um, as well as also it helps with the cleansing of the kidneys, so um, even help with filtering the kidneys. Oh, really? You know, um, mm-hmm. As well as also helps with the re- removal of toxins and poisons from the liver and the bowels. So um, cayenne pepper is so excellent. I mean, um, that's what everyone needs to be taking, especially today with the amount of chemicals that we come in contact with. You know, cayenne right. pepper is definitely one of the all-time better herbs, along with Golden seal, um, golden seal is um, also a uh, all cure herb. It's a golden seal you can't take for long periods of time. You can take it for probably about to two to three weeks, and then stop for about a week, and then after you know get back on that regimen about two or three weeks again. You know. Oh, okay. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But cayenne pepper you can take every day, you know, all day long because um, it is something in which that helps with you know 
you know, the improvement of circul of your of your circulation. And that is definitely me, especially with um people who have diabetes, heart problems, high blood pressure and you know, those things are ravishing our community. Yeah. You know, so yes. that's me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. And All also right. I mm-hmm. go ahead. Well, the meditation, I think, is also a big one for me. Um, I was because, getting ready to ask you about it. Yes, I was getting I, ready to ask you about it. <laughs> where are you? Yes. Because yes. if I stop, I, I'm i okay, but I don't seem to get, um, I guess, the intuition working the way I need it to. And when I am meditating, signs just come to me all the time. And it's interesting because I've had um, a little inflammation, not a lot, and I was in the supermarket today, and oddly enough, something fell off the shelf, and I hadn't touched anything. I thought this was very mystical. And I wanted to buy ginger. I'd been thinking about ginger, ginger, ginger. And something fell off the shelf. I turned around, and there was the ginger. I said, that is not coincidence. And those kinds of things happen when I'm meditating. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, because the meditation helps with the um, balancing of the mind, body, and spirit. Um, and soul aspect, it brings everything into union, the lower self and the higher self. So um, whenever we meditate, it's like, you know, we can give out, you know, prayers, you know, and, and hope God answers them, you know. But in order to hear if God did answer them, you must be in meditation. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like, um, you know, we can give out the call, which is prayer, but in order to receive the call back, you know, that's meditation. So um, that's why the Bible says, peace be still and know God, you know. Right. Um, that's how you know God is through being still, through meditation, you know. So meditation is definitely what is needed, you know, in this day and time, you know. Right. Um, yeah, no doubt about it. And it's so. Um, that's why my blog is staying grounded in a frantic world, too, because I think we move so much and we have so much going on all the time that we can't hear. You know, usually we're in, like, express, express, express. You know, I'm going here, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. So it's very rare that we're in um, receptive mode. By the time we stop, we're so tired that um, we just sort of pass out, I think, or we are so um, overstimulated that we're jittery and we're still not relaxed. And it's only meditation that gives me that sense of peace and receptivity. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, same here. I have to, I have to do meditations and Reiki um, before I go to sleep and every morning before I get out of bed. Um, it's just something I have to do in order to feel rejuvenated, you know, and to feel like, okay, I can start the day. Let's, let's go, you know, let's go get at the yes. world. You know, do what we yes. have to, you know, do what we have to do. So um, that is, that, that's a requirement for any person who is striving towards um, unification or yoga or yoga as they refer to it or what is actually, that's religion, you know, to tie or bind or link yourself back. What are you linking yourself back to is to your higher self, your God force within you. So we right. all need to be striving towards that path. Yes, definitely. Well, we are certainly on the same page because I um, also practice Reiki. I have not gotten, you know, higher level. I got the first level of Reiki, um, I guess, in 1995 or something like that. But I was amazed that even with that low level of involvement, I can still, you know, bring healing to areas. I can feel the energy, you know, traveling through my body. So those of you who are really... um, Deep into Reiki, there's power there. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a Reiki master teacher, so I can take you through Reiki 2 and 3 um, because, um, I mean, you just definitely have the vibes of a healer. So that's necessary for the people that you come in contact with in the uh, Raleigh, North Carolina area so that you can, you know, spread your touch and the science of, you know, universal life force energy or Reiki wow. or Chi or Ki, you know, energy, prana. You know, yes. all of these things are within the Bible, Holy Spirit, because that's actually what it is. You know, um, it's the manifestation of what we refer to as the Holy Spirit, which is one's own nature, Kundalini, you know, which is 
force, universal order personification, that universal life force energy concentrated within each and every one of us. And as we are able to um, draw down energies and and actually utilize, you know, the energies to be transmitted through our bodies, you know, mm-hmm. through our hands. You know, I mean, it's no coincidence that there's 29 compartments in the brain dedicated to the hands alone. That's more than any other organ um, the brain has connection with, you know. Wow. 29 compartments. So the hands are um, definitely um, what is utilized in order to transmit um, the most given life force energy. There's no doubt that, you know, your arms are actually an extension of your heart, (laughs) you know, and that is shown through the hugs that we give. Um, mm. on a daily and so forth and so on. So, you know, um, as it resonates at the heart, you know, it is transmitted through our arms and then um, out through our hands, you know. Um, but it's only after it comes in contact with our own um, personification or our own life force energy, you know, that the command, in order to channel it, it is given out, you know. Um, right. So Reiki is very powerful and for people who don't have a clue, I suggest that you get one because um, when we speak about the Bible and when I'm laying on hands, that's actually what they're referring to. You right. Know, um, the symbols, yeah. of course, in Reiki, right, the symbols in Reiki actually help fortify the energy and um, control the transference of, um, of bioplasmic energy because all of us have an auric field. This is basically shown through the curly in camera or a photograph in which that um, there's light in which that is emitted from our bodies. And, you know, when there's a lot of debris, negative thought forms and different other things um, clogging up our auric cell, mm-hmm. these ailments, sickness, these things can be passed on. However, with the Reiki, can't be passed on because you use the symbols as the safeguard against the transference of these particular energies, whether it's from the healer to the healee or the healee to the healer. So it's not like in shamanism in which that, um, like we've seen on the Green Mile with John Coffey having to cast off the disease after he sucks it from the from the person or after right. he um, takes on the energy from the person. You know, that's the same thing with in Qigong. Normally how that is done as with a pranic healing is the same way. Reiki is about is the only one in which actually offers safeguards in um in that regard of um transference of energy. It tones oh. down on those on right, it tones down on, on that as compared to pranic healing, as compared to shamanism, as compared to qigong or tai chi. Um, so all of them have the same healing energy. You know, uh-huh. um, some takes longer in order to master Reiki. However, you can um, gain instantly or instantaneously, you know, um, through just transmission of what is referred to as an attunement. You know, the others takes um, sometimes years. Um, like Reiki, um, it's instantaneous, but you go the same energy in order to build up to what a person of your status, like you said, Reiki 1, it actually would take them almost two years to build up. Mm, I can see, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's so, so interesting, you know. all the things you're saying, because um, it takes all of that, I think, in this t- these times in order to be healthy. You know, the eating, the the, he- the natural healing, the healing yourself, all that, without, um, it's almost like a job, do you find? <laughs> yes, it is, it is. And um, actually... Um, I love my job. I've been doing it for quite some time. And um, I started around um, the mid-'90s, early mid-'90s myself, doing um, the arts of healing. Um, I came through the Sufi order. I came into Qigong, um, Tai Chi, um, Reiki, uh, Pranic Healing, had masters such as Sun Yata Saraswati, Prince Ramesses Abu Bay, um, Montag Chia, as well as also... Um, Chua, um, Kok Sui, and many others um, actually um, have met and sat under them, you know, in some shape, form, or fashion. And they, these are, you know, masters. And I can just say, look, I, I, you know, I've actually, you know, met them and sat underneath them. As well as also Dr. York, you know, um, who also dealt with the science of healing, you know, wrote a book actually called The Science of Healing, in which that 
um, got me started actually in the um, late 80s um, with that science and on the pineal gland, the third eye area, and all that information and how to transmit healing energy through the eyes. So it was a lot of information, you know. And so um, people, listeners, um, please study because um, there might be a time when there's no hospitals or you don't have access to hospitals you know, or drugstores or so forth and so on, and the only thing that you have to depend on is the energy in which that you have access to, which is um, the sun or the solar um, flares, you know, or the cosmic energies, you know, in which that you um, can utilize and join because those things come in through the north and south pole of the planet Earth. And you as a melanated being, you have the potential in order to absorb these energies, these frequencies, these modes, these schemes, these patterns, um, geometrical shapes, you know, um, that are coming in through your melanocytes and, you know, and capture these life force energies and store this energy to be transmitted um, later on, you know. So um, these are the keys, you know, and one of the things for which that rejuvenates us and re, I guess you say revitalize and re-energize and regenerate us is actually the micro and the macro cosmic orbit. These are two techniques on which that um, I would tell the audience that they need to definitely study because um, when you close off the circuits called the Hu Yin lock and also referred to um, as uh, which is called the tongue and the root lock, those two particular locks in particular circulates the energy through the govern and the um, conceptual vessel up the back and down the front of the body, and they connect, and this causes a rejuvenation principle with each and every one of us. Um, that is what causes us to become immortal or to live long periods of time, longevity, um, as Martin Luther King says, has its place. So um, we need to find our place, you know, uh, with these particular sciences. Yeah, Definitely. All right, but I don't want to take up too much time. I definitely want to go back to some of the things in which that you was dealing with. Um, let's get into um, some more healing aspects because I know that's basically what we deal with. We deal with economics. We deal with healing. And um, I know the audience um, enjoy um, the science of healing. So um, anything else you have for us in regards to that? Well, I think... And I always think in terms of, I guess this is the teacher in me, where do we start? Because there is so much information and so much wisdom that you are sharing. And for the beginners, because there are so many people who are, you know, just, we weren't taught to heal ourselves and we weren't taught to eat to live. We are in a society that has basically um, taught us the opposite of what we need most of the time. And I know many people who really do feel that because things are sold in the supermarket, then it's good food. So I think um, I always want to start with where do we sort of begin our journey? Uh, Because there was a time when I was eating everything just because I liked it, and I had to start somewhere. And I really did start, I think, with... um, more natural foods. I didn't give up everything, but I started to eat only real food as opposed to things that were processed. Too much processed food is really has no nutrition. So I think that's a good place to start. Um, just a little bit of quiet time, even, even if you don't sit in meditation for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, just taking five or ten minutes where you are just sitting in silence and getting um, in touch with the feeling of having nothing happen is, I think, a good place to start because we are so overstimulated. Um, I have so many people I know that the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is turn on the television, and it's on as long as they're in the house. And um, I think just getting some quiet time is healing because you have to be able to hear the small voice within yourself telling you what it needs, what it wants, what it um, what you're doing that's hurting it, I think that's a good place to start. So I think those are some simple self-healing things. And drinking water. I mean, we need so much water. I tell my students all the time, um, we need, you know, our bodies, I think, are 70% water, and most days 
people drink maybe eight ounces, ten ounces, when we really should be drinking, you know, our half our body weight in water, you know, just putting down those sodas and drinking water. And I'm sure that um, many people are doing these things already, but so many people aren't because I think our bodies are addicted, um, even when we want to do them. It's, um, it's they're, they're calling us, you know, the sugar is calling us because we've been weaned on it, basically. Um, our parents didn't have that problem because it, did, it wasn't at every corner. It wasn't... Um, advertised all the time so their bodies didn't have a a craving for this but so many people crave it even as we are conscious it's still an effort so i say take those small steps and as we take those small steps um our systems get clearer and clearer and as they get clearer you um crave more of what's true and what's real and what's pure and so it is a journey it's not an overnight thing and also, I think um, being patient with ourselves because it's also emotional. If we are so hard on ourselves, then we um, don't feel we deserve a better experience. So, you know, be patient and see the small steps and um, honor yourself for any little change you make, and it feeds your desire to do more. I think that is it. And, you know, we all fall sometimes, but it's just a, it's very, very important to care enough about ourselves to jump back on and do what we know is the right thing to do because we are human, but we are also, um, our bodies are just our, our vehicle. We are spirit, so our spirits can guide us if we get our bodies under wrap, you know. that The spirit should be leading, not our bodies. And the more we balance ourselves, I think we get into our natural um, position with that. I agree. Um, I remember looking up in what's the dictionary years ago in which that I looked up the definition of spirit and seen when it was synonymous with breath. And when I looked up breath and seen it was synonymous with spirit, it clicked. That, mm. okay, in order to, to reach the spirit, you must learn how to breathe. So, hence, you have to incorporate the science of breath. You know, and so oh. um, breathing exercises, of course, we know. Uh, which is through meditation, relaxes you so that you can tap into the spirit or ancestral communications, you know, because your ancestors are all around you and they try to communicate to you, but if you're so bogged down, you know, by the nonsense of this world, by materialism, then you can't hear the voices, you know, and they can't protect you the way that they need to because you have not allowed yourself um, access for them to communicate with you. You you, you close off the... You have become unaccessible to them. And so, um, you know, there's but so much they can do. So, I mean, right. um, this, this is the importance of meditation, the science of spirit, science of breath. All of these things are necessary, you know, so that, you know, we can, you know, be the greatest force here that we possibly can become because we're a concentration of all of our ancestors. You know, they often right. say seven generations on our mother's side, seven generations on our father's side. So we in a con- we are a concentration of all of their memories, you know, to the point of when we was, um, you know, when we was, quote, unquote, um, con- you know, conceived. You know, up to that point of when we conceived, our mother and father's, all their experiences with it was, was basically put within us and their mother and father to the point of when they was conceived and so on and so on for seven generations um, back as far as the, you know, dominant uh, force within us, you know, those concentrations of memories are within us that they call our DNA, you know, and so, mm-hmm, so we have to learn how to tap into our ancestral data bank as um, Ashma Kwesi always speaks about, um, otherwise, um, you know, uh, we out in this world and we feel as if we're lonely and we'll, you know, we'll be led to depression and different other things because, you know, we will feel as if we don't have anyone to um, to talk with or to um, to help, you know, with the experiences in this life, and that's not true. Right, right. But like you say, we have to hear it, and we right. cannot hear it without breathing and meditation. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, we got some questions here, so we're going to go to the phone lines. Let's see. Area code 302. Area code 302, you're on the line. Excuse me. That's my bad. I ain't got no questions. 
a chloride in which that is stabilized, in which that um, helps also. Um, there's many other herbs in which that would help. Like we said, hawthorn berry, golden seal, um, chickweed. You know, so these are the herbs, cayenne pepper, of course. Um, whatever is going on with the heart area, these are the herbs in which that can be utilized as well as the vitamins and minerals that can be utilized in order to help with that particular problem. So magnesium phosphate is the homeopathic product for Leo, and the Leo um, um, astrologically rules the heart. So you would use... Um, um, homeopathically, you would use magnesium phosphate. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because I was uh, really, I, I was, like I tell a lot of people, even I did it myself, uh, I asked my doctor, uh, how, uh, do you, how about checking my homocysteine? And he looked real funny. It was real funny at me, like I'm, supposed, I'm not supposed to know nothing about any any of that, you know. Right. And, and uh, they like they came back to me and said, uh, they don't do that anymore. And you can never give me any reason why they don't do it anymore. Right. Well, I mean, um, they have to check the blood and and check certain components within the blood. So um, you're talking about really extra money in which that they probably would think that you don't have or if you have insurance, are you sure you want this done type of thing? You know, we talk about, remember, we're still talking about the medical industry, which is pure profit and, you know, pure business. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, the best thing is to go get you $5 worth of herbs and do the same thing, <laughs> you know, and just simply um, heal yourself instead of depending upon um you know, uh, like, like for example, um, I don't know if you was listening earlier on, but Sister Angela was talking about um, how a naturopath told her about um, her heart, and she went to go get it verified. Yes, I um, heard that. And she went to go get it verified through the doctor, you know what I'm saying, you know, which that... Um, you know, she did find out that it was, but that was through the verification of the doctor. So you can use the doctors in order to verify, you know, but I would yeah. still remedy, you know, I would still do my own remedies. Right. You know, and she, 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 mm-hmm, she said she started taking cayenne pepper. Okay. And she went back four months later, nothing was wrong. Okay. So, you know, so you can use them to de- make determinations but to remedy, you know, to put forth a remedy, I would use um, something natural, you know. Uh, I mean, we are still so natural even now, even with all the genetically altered food. We are somewhere still natural. So, you know, n- natural would still be the best thing. I know we have a lot of artificial foods, or, you know, right. a lot of chemical processed foods, steroids, antibiotics within the food, ter- um, um, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. You know, uh, MG, um, 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 MGS, what is it, um, MSG? Monosodium glutamate. Oh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. right. So we have a lot of, um, um, you know, artificial um, yellow number 5 and 40 and green, <laughs> no, 5 and blue, oh, 6. Kind of junk. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that's in the food, you know, but we're still somewhat natural. You know, even though for the artificiality, you know, um, it would still be best to take natural things. So we haven't become AI yet, artificially intelligent, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's what they move towards. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think yeah. about uh, shark liver oil? Oh, have you oh, heard of shark uh, liver oil? Well, that's just dealing with the vitamin D aspect. If you go out into the sun, I mean, um, you as a melanated being, vitamin D happens naturally as soon as you get into the sun. And um, less than two minutes, it's already being manufactured on your skin. And then it's being reabsorbed your skin back into your bloodstream in order to um, become vitamin D in order to help with the um, both calcium. Okay. Which is for your bones, your teeth, you know, your cartilage. 
Okay. So, oh, you know, that that is a substitute, but there's nothing that's a greater, you know, um, primary force than the sun itself, which is the giver of light and life. Okay, brother. Okay. In other words, everything that we talk about is secondary, but the primary force on this planet is the sun itself and the sun within the earth itself. So the sun's you know, or the primary force of life upon this planet, and we being um, a living example of the Earth, it's called Earthling, you know, um, the sun has the greatest effect upon us as well as also is um, artificial satellite, or as a satellite, as it says, um, the moon. As we know, the moon um, correlates with its phases. Um, it's um, four different phases, you know, throughout the seven days, um, or 28 days, just like the woman's myth. Happens every 28 days. So the moon deals with the um, pulling tide and the water element within the body. Um, it deals with the um, within the males with the wet dreams as well as also within the women with the menses. Okay. You know um, the sun helps with the um, chlorophyll, which is called melanin within us. Um, there is, like we said before, there's only, the only difference between chlorophyll and melanin is one magnesium molecule. Huh. Hmm. Oh, Otherwise, okay. the structures are identical. Wow. That's chlorophyll interesting. Melanin, right, chlorophyll and melanin are identical except for one magnesium molecule. And scientists will tell you that um, the only reason why, um, and then at one time that magnesium molecule was activated within us, but somehow it became dormant. And iron took over. So now we become iron-based instead of magnesium-based. But the reason why is because iron is a better uh, conductor than magnesium. So at one time we were, and we did have a greenish tint to us, just like plants. We had chlorophyll. So that's hmm. what we call olive shade. Right, we had olive Asian, shade. However, Asian, Asian, okay. Right, however, with iron becoming um, the primary um, molecule, you know, we started to rust and turn brown. Okay. Okay. What huh. what what do you think is better to use cayenne pepper with uh etchin seal or golden seal? Um, golden seal. Cayenne okay. pepper and golden seal um combined is so powerful. I mean it knocks out almost every element um element and this ease on which that could possibly be there or you think is there or is there. Okay, because I heard you said uh, three weeks is a limit for uh, using golden seal. So how many weeks right. should, should I wait before I start, I start again? No, um, only a week. You, start, you can start back after a week. Okay. In other words, you just don't want your body to become too used to golden seal. Okay. So you want to give it a week in order to get back, you know, do its bodily functions, and then you can start it back again um, um, the following week. You know, so one week. You know, so two weeks, two, three weeks on, one week off, two, three weeks on, one week off. It would be like that. Wow, okay. As long as you give your body a break, um, it can't do damage to your liver. If you were taking it excessively for months and months and months every day, then it can do damage to your liver. But when you do the breaks, then your body has the ability in order to eliminate uh, what it don't need. Okay. Well, I didn't know that. I sure did. Oh, yeah. Okay. Angela, um, you yes. wanted to say something on that topic? Yes. Uh, well, just I had a little testimony about the golden seal myself. Um, years mm-hmm. ago, my cousin had a pink eye. He had, was traveling, had pink eye, and I looked in one of my books, and it said to put golden seal, I can't remember the third ingredient, and um, vitamin C. I made a little paste and diluted it. And the next morning it was gone. Both things right. gone. Was, was, was it eye bright? Huh. I no, it wasn't eye bright because I didn't have that. But I had all three ingredients in the house. Yeah. I can't remember that third one. Wow. And yeah, it was okay. the next day. It was gone. He could wear contact <laughs> lenses. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we know that for the eyes, golden seal, yellow dot, bilberry, um, eye bright. Those are excellent herbs when liquefied into a tea can definitely be put into the eyes in order to heal the eyes. 
of um, irritation, redness, pink eye, um, cataracts, glaucoma. You know, so I know everybody right now just think weed is the only thing that can get rid of glaucomas <laughs> or help with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not, you know, so, you know, because all the movies, that's what they keep showing you. I got uh, I got glaucoma, that's why I'm smoking it. You know, but, uh. but you know, but there's more um, herbs that can be utilized um, um, for those types of things, along with the eyes. Um, and we've gone over some of this information before for those who are regular listeners. You know, um, for brain issues, um, ginkgo biloba, guadalcola, ginseng, or known as the triple um, Gs, you know, which that helps with brain functions, All right? Um, okay. The eye already done. Of course, um, the throat, um, we could use um, cayenne pepper, mullein for the upper respiratory system in order to remove mucus as well as also from the throat and nasal passages. It would be cayenne pepper and mullein, as M-U-L-L-E-I-N. Okay, for cayenne the lungs. pepper and mullein, okay. Mullein. I'll write that mm-hmm. down. For the, right, for the lungs, um, same thing. Um, so for the nasal passage, the throat and the lungs, cayenne pepper and mullein. For the liver, milk thistle, dandelion, you know, to cleanse the liver. Okay. Um, as well, also the kidneys. All right. For the right. stomach, small, large intestines would be um, Kasagara, Sinew Greek, Aloe Ferox, you know, mm-hmm. I'm all real good at it. Mm-hmm. You know, for the genital area, um, herbs for the women will be Don Kwai, Damiana, you know, red raspberry. For the males will be supplemental, Picium, Damiana, Horny Gold Weed, The Sarsaparilla. The Sarsaparilla. The Sarsaparilla. I take Sarsaparilla. Uh, but he's, but I remember you saying the one lecture you was given that it you, uh, you had to take so much of it. Right, right. Well, um, there's extracts in which they can utilize. Um, it seems to me that liquid works better than the powder form. Okay. So if you make it into a um, tea, you know, um, you know, um, you can actually take the powder form about half of a teaspoon or a teaspoon or so, put it in a coffee maker machine um, within the filter and brew it and drink two or three cups, you know, um, a day. You know, it okay. um, seems to help quicker because it's liquefied. You know, you can also make it into a concentration, into a droplet and put um, do the concentration if you add. Now, there's a way in order to make it in which you can actually add um, glycerin, um, 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 alcohol, you can actually use vodka or gin um, right. based on proof um, along with the particular herb and which that you will let it um, concentrate over a few days or so. Um, you can also use, um, use that and actually put it within the dropper and drop it and actually put it underneath your tongue. Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, go directly into your bloodstream. It has a certain effect on me, though, uh, the salt and metal. I'd probably talk, talk to you about that when, when, in private when I... Okay. It has um, a certain, well, I, it's well, not bad, but it's... Uh, right. I didn't think it would have that effect, though. Okay. It's, it's, no, I, I really didn't. But uh, it would kind of... Uh, I don't know. I might as well say it. Uh, sometimes it gets me aroused sometimes. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know well, why. Well, I mean, that's not because you're healing that area. And when that area is um, area is healed, I mean, that's just the natural function of, of that of of that particular nature, you know, okay. um, it's arousal. I mean, um, actually, the more aroused you are shows the more healthy you are. Okay. The less arousal, you might want to question. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. That's you all know. about circulation, well, isn't it? Good circulation. Go. That's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because I, I, uh, I was kind of, kind of, kind of a little bit, you know, uh, wondering because I don't want to have a sister on on the line. So I said, well, we may sit and talk about that. Oh but no, said, it's okay. I'm gonna, a grown up. It's all right. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> I said, well, no, it's not a stimulant. So why is it making me doing that? You know. Yeah, all circulation. So, you know, the soft middle. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. So now I'm, I know that the honey go weed does it. But when I take the salt and metal, I said, does it too? And I'm like, hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that's um, your MB. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maca. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all, of them, all of them do it. And that's okay. because um, that's that's the natural function of a healthy, from lower nature. Okay. Mm-hmm. And remember, that's where your life force is concentrated at, is in your genitals. Okay. No, um, my teacher, um, Sonia, that says, what he said, that's your soul. That's one of the chakras. Isn't it? Right, uh, that's, one, okay. that's one of the seven Elohims. Okay. Or the seven, that's the, that's the um, root chakra. You know, okay. what, what do you think when you talk about Jesus being the root of David? What's the root of David? Hmm? If David was in Hebrew, means beloved. And Jesus is the root of David, what do you think they was talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got me there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, they talk about your lower nature. They talk about your genitals and that life force energy in which that permeates from that particular location or area. Anyone uh, knows that that's the quickest, that's the quickest and the most powerful area in the body that gets stimulated. There's no other area in the body in which that gets and receives more stimulation than that area. That's the reason why it's so important. Uh, within um, the raising of children also um, to be taught the proper science of sex, you mm-hmm. know, so that they won't repeat that area because that is their life force. And if they want to live long periods of time, you know, a long period of time, then they will have to utilize that energy in order to rejuvenate themselves on a daily basis. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, they, you know, because, I mean, you can't stop a teenager from masturbating. Well, you can teach them, though, how to raise that energy up through those seven chakras in order to rejuvenate themselves. Okay. Something which that our parents definitely didn't teach us. The reason why, because they didn't know. So they never taught, they never was taught how to create yoga or any of the, um, of these particular sciences because all this information was hidden. Okay. In Tibet, in the um, yogi traditions, in um, the Orient of the Japanese and the Chinese. And it was only passed through the family line or through um, students, you know, teachers and student relationship. It was never, you know, um, available to us as it is now. Oh, no. Oh, no, it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Teach them how to maintain that energy. Mm-hmm. To maintain that energy. Mm-hmm. Not right. waste the seed, you know. You're right, exactly. That was the, script, that was the um, science of the story of Odin within the Bible. It says that God killed Odin. For the spilling of his seed, mm-hmm. you know, because they were showing you how precious the seed or the life force is within you, and then when you waste it, you know, um, you kill yourself. That's what it meant by God kill Odin. It wasn't like God just struck Odin down and said, "Oh, you look at you." <laughs> wow. You no, know, it was somebody that you killed yourself. You know, wow. you destroyed. Remember when, it, when when you read the Bible and it says about um. Um, do you not know that your body is the temple of God, you know, and that, um, and, and if you do not know that your body is the temple of God, then um, if you try to destroy your temple, then God will destroy you, you know. So that's what it says, you know, and so that is a clear explanation of what happened with Odin. When you waste your life force, you deplete yourself, so therefore you die. I mean, and it's no coincidence. I mean, we're looking at Francis Bacon or Shakespeare within, um, I think it was in Hamlet, um, where he made the statement that he died a thousand times within the lap of this woman. You know, he was talking about that he spilled his seed a thousand times. And each time he spilled his seed, he died. And that killed him. Right. He knew, right. He knew that that was deep, uh, was, um, was, um, de- um, was basically deleting his life force. 
you know, so we have to look at these things. This is all scriptural, but there are things and keys within the scriptures on which that do and are relevant to us um, even today and that we can utilize. All of them isn't just the story of, you know, Moses splitting the Red Sea and then having to think on how they relate to you here and now in this day and time. <laughs> I know was one uh, basketball player, or what's the basketball player? Said he been with seven hundred women or something, you know. And I'm like, oh yeah, right. You talking about you talking about Solomon? Yeah, Solomon had seven hundred concubines and three hundred wives. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Women. I said, oh, he's still living, you know. Yeah, right, but you got to understand that that was that that was something dealing with science because seven hundred and three hundred is one thousand. Um, at the top of your head, you have the one thousand um lotus petals. When you become enlightened, hmm. and Solomon was known as the wisest man, hmm. so that's wow. actually what the woman was symbolic to. The woman was the completing energy. That's why he refers to within Proverbs as a her. When you see wisdom, it's referred to as a her, she. Hmm. That's the completing, hmm. and as the completing moves up the spinal column, um, um, the last place it hits is the top of the head, in which that unfolds the one thousand petals of light. So hence. To sit one thousand women of Solomon, you know, have nothing to do with you know actual women in that regard. It's about the power of the food within you, just like you have one thousand horsepower. That's what it's talking about. One thousand horsepower to about the Kundalini. Okay. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. See, these are all stories, but you have to study metaphysics and esoteric teachings in order to grasp what is actually being said. This is why it's hidden. This is why within Freemasonry, within the Rosicrucians, the Golden Dawn, the OTO, all these different other sects and, you know, um, secret societies, this is what is hidden within those particular schools of thought. And they know that the masses won't be ready for it, you know, but who are they in order to determine who's ready for it or not? This is why... This this is why I teach what I teach you because um, I can't say who is or not. I just give it and let chips fall where they may. And then I see five years down the line, ten years down the line, people are still studying. And they come to me and say, yo, you know, I seen that tape that you had years ago. And, man, you know I grew from that. So you don't know who does what, and you can't, and you don't have the right to determine um, who can get what information. <laughs> Right, and this is a new age. I mean, you can just see that I think I, sometimes I feel like our survival is hinged on knowing the things that have been kept from us because, it, you know, they're always talking about the end of the world, the end of the world, but I think it's the end of the world as we know it. But because we've right. gotten so far away from, you know, what truly is life and what truly is pure, and so we need this information in order to, you know, just change the way we live. I agree. Yes, right. I agree. When they talk about the uh, Aquarian age, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the Pisces age, the Pisces now in the Aquarian age, you know, now well, that's I mean, what I'm talking about. This, this you're right. This is even talked within the yoga tradition. It says that we have left the age of Kali Yuga, and now we have entered the age of Sata Yuga. Okay. Now, this is this is taught now within the teachings of the um, of the yogi traditions. So the Yogis are correlating their same signs of their calendar and time periods to the Mayan calendar, or the Olmec Mayan calendar time periods, as well as also to the so-called New Age um, calendar of the alignment of this of this galactical alignment. All of this is correlating at this same time period right now as we speak. You know of um, of these. I mean, look in the '70s when we was talking about um, the fifth dimension. You know, right. and they were saying the age of Aquarius. Right, I remember that. Why do mm-hmm. they call themselves the fifth dimension? Because they knew that's where we were headed was into the fifth world, according to the Hopi, um, um, to the Hopi prophecies, and also to the Aboriginal and the African prophecies. They all speak about this fifth world. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what is the fifth world? The fifth world is the fifth dimension, and so real fourth dimensional beings being held down by predominantly third-dimensional beings who don't want us to make the graduation into the fifth world or into this new heaven and the new earth. But it's a little bit too late right now because this radio show and many others, as well as many lecturers and speakers and um, teachers, 
or demonstrating that, you know, it's too late. This information is out and people are growing and we will reach that level of consciousness. And the fifth dimension is just merely utilizing energy. The third dimension is based on length, width, and height. The fourth dimension is based on depth, which is based on time and space. And the fifth dimension is based on energy. So the fifth dimension do the science all the time, good thing. Right, right. This is why the show that we've been building with on here tonight is dealing with energy. We talked about prana, chi, ki, holy spirit, kundalini, everything. We talk about energy, and this is where this is moving towards because we know that um, that's where we are. Scientists or quantum physicists have determined that your physical body is composed of stars. That's energy. If you are a star, if you are a walking star, you know, um, a walking light. You know, that's what you are. You emit heat, mm. you emit light, you emit uh, radiation. This has all been proven. Mm-hmm. This is one on one. You know, energy can't be transformed, just simply contained. You know, it can be transformed and, and contained, you know, but energy can't be destroyed. That's what somebody told me about the Halloween 1, 2, and 3. That was uh, Michael Myers. It was the dealing with the energy, why they couldn't kill him. Right. But that was uh, some brother told me about that. He said that uh, there was the pumpkin was the symbolic of at the top when they cut off the top. That was symbolic of letting the energy out. And uh, um. I, I I forgot all what he told me, but I, I was been so long ago. But I, I didn't really at that time I wasn't I was conscious of a lot of things. So I kind of let it go. Right. Right. Now I wish I could have listened to him more. There's so much to know. It is. I have really enjoyed being on your show. Thank you for having me. Oh, we appreciate you being on here. And um, please give out your um, your website before you go. Okay, um, it's um, www.thewritingclinic.com, thewritingclinic.com, and that has information about um, my books and my blog, which is angelabelcherepps.blogspot.com, and um, hopefully we will all be in touch in the community because it's all about sharing information. And I've learned so much from you tonight um, about energy. I have too. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it confirms what I need to know about just continuing on the path. Oh, that's excellent because, um, I mean, that's what we do. We've been doing it for a long time. So, you know, that's what we do. We we share energy. You know, sh- we share energy, you know, information, knowledge. You know, um, to me, that is energy. So, um, you know, everybody can grow from it. You know, it's yeah. positive energy. I know um, I've experimented in which that was done by um, Masaru Emoto, Japanese scientist, in which that he spoke positive things into a glass of water, froze the glass of water, looked at it on a microscope, and it was a six-point star configuration, the light mm-hmm. flakes. Mm-hmm. Then they took another glass of water and spoke negative things into it and uh, froze it and then looked at it under a microscope, and it would look discombobulated, no structure, Whatsoever, the molecules didn't have any structure. It just looked dark and 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 just you know no form. So huh. yeah, we are seventy five percent water. Our brain is ninety percent water. Spinal column is eighty percent water. You know our blood is ninety percent water. You know, and we're an aquatic being. What does this say about when you speak positive things, do prayers, um, affirmations, decrees? You know, uh, for yourself. You know, what right. does it say? You know, when we have to hear negative things, you know, what does it do? You know, so, right. you know, it's, you know, so we know that these are sciences, you know, and um, these are things in which that is needed for health, you know, and wellness. But um, we appreciate you all for being on. Thank you, Sister Angela. And um, we definitely will have you on again. I would you know, love to I, come again. All right. Yeah. appreciate you. And, um, Brother L, appreciate you um, coming on and asking them questions. All right, and um, we're going to see you all. All right, and we're going to see you all next week. Peace I'm and love. Forward to it. Peace and love. Peace and love. Bye bye. Bye bye.
Easy. Uh, of course, we're on the radio. Finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Proceeding in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns in existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intentions straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. 